Hello and welcome to Launch Time Politics, reaching you from our global headquarters here in the nation's commercial nerve center, Lagos, Nigeria. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Big things happening in the world of politics. So let's give you what the headlines look like. All eyes on the Supreme Court tomorrow as governors of Lagos, Kanu, Zamfara, Plateau, Ebony, and Bauchi State await outcome of appeals challenging their victory in the 2023 governorship election. The Apex Court also reserves judgment in the Ogun State governorship election. The old progressives Congress may be, may be in for a tough political future as Professor Patu Tommy hints on the formation of a new mega party driven by ideology. Former spokesperson of the PDP Presidential Campaign Council, Mr. Daniel Boala, declares support for President Bola Tinubu after visiting the nation's number one citizen at the villa. Thanks again for joining us right here on Channels Television, where we'll bring you all the stories we've been tracking in the polity. Now, it's a waiting game with better breath for six governors of Lagos, Kano, Tamfara, Plateau, Ebony, and Bauchi states. As the Supreme Court has reserved judgment in the suit challenging their victory in the 2023 governorship election. Now, in a similar decision, the Supreme Court also reserved judgment in the appeal filed by Mr. Ladipukbo Adeputu, challenging the majority judgment of the Court of Appeal that affirmed the election of Governor Dakba Abiodu of Ogun State. A five-member panel of the APS Court led by Justice John Okoro adjourned for judgment after parties argued and adopted their processes. Mr. Adeputu is asking the court to set aside the election because INEC had initially cancelled elections in 99 polling units and ordered that fresh elections be conducted in those polling units. The electoral body then went ahead to declare Mr. Abiodun the winner of the election, according to them disregarding the margin of the vote. The governor had won the election with 13,000 votes, and the votes from the council polling units is estimated to be about 44,000. Let's stay with the Supreme Court, uh, where 11 new justices have been confirmed by the legislature and now ready to be sworn in at the Supreme Court premises sometime next week. Some of the judges include uh, Justice Jumai Hanatu Sanke, that's from the North Central, Justice Stephen Jonah Ada from the North Central, Justice Mohammed Baba Idris, Justice Haruna Simon Samani from the Northeast, Justice Jamiyo Yamana Toko from the Northwest, others are Justice Apopaka Sadiq Uma from the Northwest, Justice Chidi Ebere Nwaoma Uwa from Southeast, Justice Chioma Egundu Nwosuiheme from the Southeast, Justice Obande Festus Ogbunia from the Southeast, Justice Mo Asaimo Adumen from the South South, Justice Habib Adewale Abiru from the Southwest. President Bala Tinubad in December 2023 asked the Senate to confirm 11 nominees for appointment as Justices of the Supreme Court. They say in politics, just like football, anything can happen, which perhaps describes the decision by a former spokesperson to the PDP Presidential Campaign Council in the 2023 general elections, Mr. Daniel Boala, as he's pledged his full commitment to supporting the administration of President Bola Tinubu. He was speaking after he paid a visit to the president at the State House in Abuja. Mr. Boala says, with the pulse of the polity, it is only proper for citizens to support the administration of President Tinubu. Good evening. Good evening. Um, we'd like to know why you're here. Okay. <laughs> I honor the invitation of His Excellency President Bola Tinubu, who is a father to the nation, uh, who God has given the opportunity to lead the country at this uh, difficult time. And so I came to celebrate and congratulate him, and then to also uh, give him our commitment that as citizens of the country, this is a time for all of us to throw our weight behind and support the administration. I gave um, an, an illustration of an aircraft, an aircraft that has taken off. The aircraft is a country. The passengers are the citizens. The pilot is Mr. President. His co-pilot is Excellency, the Vice President. The cabin officials might be the ministers or other agents of the Federation. You may not like the takeoff of the airplane. You may have even your perspective about the way the pilot is, you know, walking towards the turbulence, you know, above the sea level. But one fact that must bind all of us is that the plane needs to land. 
so all of us can be alive. When it lands, you can also say you don't like the way it lands. But at, at the 39,000 feet above sea level, the prayer of everybody, including the pilot and the passenger, will be the safe landing of the car, of the plane. Because if the plane crashes, apart from the aircraft getting destroyed, the pilot, the co-pilot, the cabin members, and all the passengers' life are at risk. So at this difficult time, what we need is to throw our support and then see how uh, we're able to navigate around. Because there are difficult things in this country, hardship, poverty, insecurity. And the only way we can come together and support the achievement of this objective, I think, is for us to give our best in supporting uh, the administration. So I came to congratulate him and then to tell him that I'm particularly excited about the recent policy decision he has taken to demonstrate that he's about the people and not just protecting his people. He took decisions against certain ministers who allegedly were you know, said to have committed infraction. And the marked difference between him and the previous administration is that the previous administration may want to cover in order to avoid the backlash that the government is corrupt. But he is not uh, about that. If this thing will touch on the poorest of the poor, humanitarian, that's the focus. You say in politics, anything is possible. Let's move on now. The Progressives Governors Forum have pledged their support for the federal government to the promise to promote all policies initiated by President Bola Tinubu led administration, including government's fight against corruption. Shortly after meeting, uh, the meeting of the forum held behind closed doors in Abuja, the chairman of the forum and governor of Imo State, Mr. Hope Uzadima, says the governors elected under the platform of the APC are united in their resolve to promote good governance. The meeting was attended by governors of Kogi, Gombe, Lagos, Yobe, Kebi, Jigawa, and Ondo. Orders in attendance include governors of Ebonyi, Sokoto, Kaduna, Ikiti, Fara, Cross River, and Gun State. The meeting gave us the opportunity to review the goings on in the country and also how agreed on how best to continue to support our government and our party with a view to maximizing the current policies, the benefits of the current policies of our administration. The Progressive Governors Forum are united in supporting the administration, APC administration, Ably led by our ebullient president, President Aswajibola Ahmed Tinimbu GCFR. We continue to support him. We we'll take his policies to the grassroots. And as subnational leaders of our great party, ensure that our people come on the same page with the thinking of the government, which is primary objective is how to secure the country and provide adequate welfare to the good people of our dear country. Well, before we continue with more political stories, uh, there is a development in Lagos. A few days ago, the federal government has announced that there will be a partial closure of the third mainland bridge to enable some work to go on, and it's going to happen for a couple of weeks on the third mainland bridge, we popularly call 3MB. Our correspondent, uh, Olu Phillips, has been following that development and is standing by at the third mainland bridge to give us the latest development. Uh, Olu, uh, I can see you and exactly, I'm sure that uh, the people want to know exactly uh, what is the latest update as far as the work is concerned on in that area of the third mainland bridge. Waste no time. The, uh, 12 o'clock every day, this is going to happen. You can see the contractor is hard at work trying to keep up to that 12 hourly um, time change as soon as it was 12 noon this afternoon um, these men and their workers and their tractors you can see they are just closing the road up to traffic of those heading into the island they will do this consistently twice um, every day should i say or twice over a 24 hours period and they are stationed here the security men are stationed here the workers are all stationed here 12 o'clock in the afternoon, this is what they will do. 12 midnight today, they will come again to remove these barricades you're seeing here. Um, they have the security guys also making sure that all is well and good because if these guys are going to work by midnight, 
that you want to ward off uh, every form of um, hoodlums and anything that could be a security threat. And so at this point, what happens is that if you're coming here, you are late, you have not beaten the time, so you have to be diverted this way. And we did promise you on Channel <coughs> Television that we'll keep you updated as things happen. From here, we're going to move over to um, the alternative routes to bring the situation reports on how it's going out there, how people are coping with the time change. So far, nothing on tour has happened. So far, it's not been anything other than um, a smooth um, ride and smooth drive and smooth transition. We saw that earlier this morning and later in the bulletin. Tonight at 10, you'll be seeing um, how, the trans how the movement and the diversion happens in the daytime. So the third Melon Bridge, let me say this, isn't closed totally. Um, this information has to be out there. The third Melon Bridge isn't closed totally. So in the mornings, let me repeat that again, when you're going to the island, you can use the third Melon Bridge. In fact, from 12 midnight this morning, you can use the third Melon Bridge till 12 noon at about some minutes after now you can use the third million bridge but once it's 12 noon you'll be diverted to alternative routes or other areas that allows you to get into the island the same thing vis-a-vis -vis those or vice versa those who are also coming from the mainland you can do that from this time you can only do that from this time till midnight or some one minute to midnight and that's the situation that's going to be um happening over the next six to seven weeks when the contractor will now move over to the other side to repeat the same form of work and when we also All arrived right. this morning we've not seen so much of um, in terms of work going on right. in terms of milling and scraping off the road that needs to be worked on jeffrey all right well thanks so much for, for your reporting we'll keep uh, following you uh, as uh, this work continues we must thank you for bringing us that update well, let's come back here to bring you more political stories. Days after a suspension as Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has seized a travel document of Dr. Beta Edu. The anti-graft agency also seized that of her predecessor, Sadia Umar Farouk, as well as the suspended coordinator of the National Social Investment Program, Halima Shewu. The three women are required to report at the EFCC office in Abuja on a daily basis as part of investigation into the alleged financial infractions running into billions of Naira. The EFCC, however, says it has recovered about 39.8 billion Naira out of the 44.8 billion Naira allegedly embezzled from the government account by Ms. Shill. And this fight against corruption uh, allegedly committed by uh, these uh, individuals in the humanitarian ministry, both the current minister and the suspended minister, as well as her predecessor and everybody involved, allegedly, is the focus of our conversation. I'm being joined from our Abuja studios uh, by the executive director of Aid Africa, Mr. James Uguchuku. Mr. Uguchuku, thank you for coming on the program. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My first question would be, how impressed are you with the actions of government and the anti-graft agency so far? Well, uh, I would say I'm not too impressed by what is going on because uh, we are looking at uh, what the government and the anti-graft agency know exists in our polity. Uh, the such light is being beamed on the humanitarian affairs ministry now. Uh, the question we're asking is uh, all the stories we've been hearing since 2022 up to now, what have the anti graft agency done about it? What has the government done about it in terms of revisiting the issues? How the issues of Nigerian air, how the issues of uh, different things? I can't start mentioning them now. What has the government done about it? But in this particular one, it's a good thing that the president was able to demonstrate that he is not going to condone any minister under his administration misappropriating funds. So that one is a welcome development. But for me, uh, he has a lot to do in terms of uh, ensuring that he put a such light on all the ministry. We are looking at six months down the line now. What are their scorecards? What have they achieved so far? What have they been doing with the money appropriated to their different ministries and the uh, MDAs under their ministry? So if the president is really serious about fighting corruption, we'll be looking at getting to all these military and start putting such lights on them. Uh, this case of uh, Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, 
is uh, that of uh, the dog that has uh, eaten defecation is the one that uh, eats cheats, so to say. So other ministry, what is happening there? So the president should launch a serious investigation in all the ministry. What are they doing with public funds? Are you saying, uh, if I understood you correctly, are you saying this is just for the optics and the government looking for a fall guy or they're actually acting as a government should act? Well, it's not uh, acting as a fall guy in the sense that uh, at least this is the first instance in their own uh, administration. It's the first instance, and I'm glad that they are taking this uh, step. And I think this will should be pursued to the logical conclusion or the case of uh, if the investigation is found uh, is found uh, uh, is carried out sorry and uh, they are found wanting and they will give in slap on the wrist as we used to see in other administration if they are found wanting then they should answer for it and they should be used as a deterrent for other political office holders to be very careful how they handle a uh, public fund you see what makes people to be emboldened to be acting this way in the country is because they've seen that their predecessor were not held accountable when they misappropriate uh, public funds. So they have that uh, brazen boldness to go ahead to be doing what is uh, what they are doing now. So for me, I think uh, the uh, administration took a right step, but they have more to do. That's the point I'm trying to put in here. As you've alluded, there's nothing new about suspending a minister. We've seen all kinds of scenarios as far as uh, this Fort, uh, uh, Fort Republic is concerned. We've even seen the incident that involved the NDDC at some point where the MD collapsed and uh, investigations were done. They said there's going to be a forensic audit that is a funnel to channel. Uh, people are using the NDDC to, uh, to, to steal money from government and all of that. We, it was a big issue. In fact, the popular phrase, off your mic, came from that investigation. Uh, as, as it stands today, we really don't know what came out of all of that. So what do you think, think Nigerians are expecting? Because it's, it's safe to assume that Nigerians are not necessarily impressed that someone is suspended or sacked and all of that. What do you think Nigerians want to see at the end of all of this if these individuals are indeed found guilty and every other person? I think uh, you rightly said this, that uh, this is not the first instance. In fact, uh, there is a statistic that was put up by some organization about money that has been transferred to private accounts. And I tell you that in that statistic, we have up to 20 point something billion transferred to a particular personal account. And this is where the government needs to start having synergy with the civil society because the civil society, we have the capacity to track all these things and uh, come up with some hidden fact that ordinarily, uh, the media or other people will not be able to see. So now, going forward, we should be looking at government ensuring that all pending corruption cases should be, you know, uh, pushed to the logical conclusion, like the one you mentioned now, off your mic and all that. Nobody is hearing about it, and so also is many, uh, many other corruption cases like this. So the government of the day should be able to not starting only. Uh, with their own minister, they should go and work with the EFCC and, of course, allow EFCC to be completely independent in pursuing all this to ensure that all the people that are found wanting, are, all these cases are resurrected and they are punished accordingly. These are what Nigerians want to see because uh, Nigerians are tired of reading all these negative stories on a daily basis. Nigeria wants to see the country moving forward. And Nigeria wants to see that their taxpayer money are being used by the government judiciously. Right. Because what is happening here is a case of, uh, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. You collect money from the ordinary citizen and one single person will, because they are occupying right. a public office, divert it to their own personal account. That's unacceptable. Mr. Ogochuko, I won't let you go without asking you, because when we hear these monies, let, let's be clear, this is not two, 2,500 naira. This is not uh, even 100,000 naira. We're talking billions. How come it's so easy to steal government money in Nigeria at this, if it's an industry, we'll call it industrial scale. Let's remember this is an allegation, but we've seen convictions and all of that. How come it's so easy to steal money from the government of Nigeria, in, despite all the legislation we have against theft? Why? Is it a systemic problem supported by the system to steal from the system? Or what exactly are we missing out here? 
I think the problem is multifaceted. We'll, try, we'll start by the mode of appointment. The question you ask yourself is how did this kind of uh, characters get into our public service? What did the DSS do in terms of uh, you know, investigating these people and carrying a security check before they are presented to the Senate for appointment? The other issue is that uh, there's no deterrent for all this misdemeanor. In a case like China, for instance, now, you know that if you have found one thing, it's, it's firing squad, you'll be killed. You know, and your family will pay for the bullets. So people have the mind to do this because they know they can do it and they can get away with it and nothing will happen. So until we reverse that trend, it will still keep on happening. Better Edu we are talking about as of 1999 was just 13 years old as of then. So she saw the, the pattern of looting that has been going on and nothing happened. So she can be, you know, uh, have that boldness to attempt doing this if she's proven uh, guilty at the end of the day. So we need to change that narrative to ensure that those that are found, you know, touching public for that death with seriously. Until we get that, the stealing is just uh, warming up. For your perspective, uh, Mr. Uh, James Ugochuku, Executive Director, Aid Africa. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And now to other stories. The APC may likely be preparing for a strong rivalry in the next election cycle as some stakeholders are considering what they call a mega coalition to wrestle power from the ruling party. A professor of political economy, Professor Pato Tomi, gave the hint when he appeared on our program Politics Today where he revealed that talks are ongoing with the prominent political leaders, including former presidential candidate Mr. Tiko Abubakar, Mr. Peter Obi and Rabi Okwankoso over the possibility of the creation of what he describes as a mega party that will be a strong opposition force driven by ideologies. Let's leave elections for now. Let's look at how our country can be made to work for everybody. And let's create a political party that can bring the issues to the fore for all the Nigerian people to have a kind of consensus on how to solve problems. If we have that consensus, we will find Nigerians who can provide leadership positions. And the, the provision of those leadership positions will not be about what they get for themselves because this narcissism is a cancer that is tearing Nigerian politics down. What we need are people who sacrificially give up themselves to build a great country with their possible reward being immortality. When I talked to several of the presidential candidates in the last run about this track we are traveling, yes, I've had conversations with Elijah Chiku Abubakar, I've had conversations with Engineer Rabi Kwankwaso, I've had conversations with Peter Gregory Obi, uh, and the people like uh, Raf Okewosu of ADC and some of those that would probably constitute some of the base. And I've said to them, it's not about you. It's about Nigeria. It's about the ordinary person in the state. In a Kwaibom state, Governor Moino is seeking the support of the federal government to establish the Ibom Deep Sea Port, which can serve the Niger Delta region and provide an alternative to the Lagos port. The governor who spoke in the State House, Abuja, after meeting with President Bala Tinubu, says he also made a request for support to revive the state's agricultural program on oil palm. He explains how the state can produce oil palm or enough palm oil for exports out of Nigeria. We've talked and um, requested him to support us with our Ibom Deep Sea Port and our agricultural program on the oil palm. Akwaibom is an oil palm zone, and we have started the process of uh, uh, revamping a moribund um, industry that has laid there for 28 years. It's being revamped right now. We need the support of the federal government to be able to have a full value chain of, and then bring our people to work and be able to help uh, Nigeria. We can even get to exporting palm oil. You know, because right now we're still importing a lot of it. So, the Bomb Deep Sea Port has the deepest uh, droughts that will bring in uh, ship and we can transship from that point. Again, 
Lagos is there, but you also know Lagos is congested. Of course, that is no story. So you need a deep sea port that will take care of the southeast, south, south, um, if you like, the Niger Delta region. We need to partner with the federal government, of course, to get um, work going in the state. Akwaibom is part of Nigeria. He's the president of Nigeria. He needs to know how one of his component states is doing. And then finally, we head out to River State, where the River State Traditional Rulers Amendment Law 2024 bill presented on the floor of the House on Tuesday has passed second reading. A correspondent reports that the bill has been co-signed to the House Committee on Chief Tenancy Affairs, who have two weeks to report back to the House. The House, also led by uh, Honorable Martin Amiwile, started today's plenary by observing a mini silence to the people who lost their lives in a boat mishap somewhere in the Andoni area of the state. And they provided a token of two million naira from their salaries to support the victims' families. Well, that's the program for today. Thank you so much for your time and, of course, your usual company. Tomorrow is going to be a big day at the Supreme Court. We'll bring you all the details right here on Lunchtime Politics. I want to thank you for your time. I'm Jeffrey Uzango. You've been served on Lunchtime. <laughs>